It was a Māori organisation affiliated with Te Anga Waka Marae. They started talking about that they were tōhangas because of the continuous threats towards our family, our children. After the continuous telling him, I just I don't want the sexual contact. You know, I looked at one of the teenage girls, I know because I've been through that sort of abuse. And in my head, I promised them I'll be back because of the children that I leave behind. My name is Brenda Louise Harrison Bassica. I'm a Māori Yugoslavian from the northern town of Kaitaia. My grandparents um, are from California Hill, also affiliated to Papaka Hirakino. My grandmother, Mariah Rakic, my grandfather, Tony Rakic. My grandmother was also a Rapata. My Yugoslavian grandparents, Zach and Annie Basica, are affiliated to Waiharara. I am a woman that has a history of sexual abuse. Later on in life, I was raped. Um, this led me to, the side effects of that abuse throughout my life led me to getting into situations that were violent with men because I believe that I was looking for a protector because I still had that hurt inside me from the sexual abuse. I got to a stage that I wanted to seek help for it. So my cousin referred me to this place. Um, that she had been to, and it was a Māori organisation affiliated with Te Anga Waka Marae in Auckland. I went there and they offered me to attend their personal development program. It was Māori based. Um, so I attended it, and it was a class based program. And they didn't mention anything about it being more spiritual than physical. And they taught us different things like who you are in projects, like, you know, are you good at the beginning, middle, end? Um, tarot cards, which I thought was a bit strange for a personal development program, but anyway. And then they slowly slowly brought in more spirituality. They started talking about that they were tohangas, but they said originally they were social workers. But I thought, oh, well, you know, fine. And it just got to the point that they started, a part of the program, they had discipline. And they said to us, you have to shop on a certain day, you have to not talk on the telephone after a certain time. And they said, if you do, things will go wrong and it'll be your tūpuna that are doing it to you. And, you know, everyone in the class sort of like, you know, they thought it was funny. But slowly, you know, um, like Kevin Trudeau says, the more sillier it sounds, the more it stays in your head. And without us realising, they were slowly putting into us fear of our ancestors, our tūpuna. And then it became about them. It was like, you know, we have the power. We have great mana. This program is channeled through one of our so-called healers. But they were all classed as social workers. They slowly brought in the tohanga thing and that things were channeled. It became more and more about spirituality. Then they took us on journeys. Um, and through the sexual abuse, I suffered disassociation. I had PTSD. I didn't know that at that time. Further on, I got um, assessed and that's what I was diagnosed with. And to me, when you take someone on astro-traveling, journeys and they suffer disassociation and this is from my personal experience it actually is not good for them it makes them actually disassociate more but the main thing was that they started talking about the commitment part of the program and they said you know to do the real work for our people you need to move up north 
to kaitaia and that vicinity because that is where the real teachings are and the work if you want to help your people. Just a personal development program. That, that's, that was a, and to me, it was to make you a better person. You know, it, it, they didn't say, well, actually, it's more spiritual than anything else. They slowly brought that in, and they slowly brought in that your tūpuna will hurt you if you do not do what is required of you in this program, and the discipline part, like shopping on certain days. Like someone's car broke down, and they said, well, did you break discipline? And, you know, I looked at them like, you know, I, I think a few people in the cast did, like, really? But it slowly went into my head without even realising it. They mind-manipulated us to fear our ancestors and, most of all, fear them. It went from the spiritual part of our tūpuna will hurt us if we break this discipline and don't listen to them having the power. But they just did it so slowly, you didn't even realise what was happening to you. And we did laugh about it, but we didn't realise that it was actually being embedded in our head. Our tutor was actually one of their past clients, and one of the social workers, they came in at a different time. And this male came into the class. I noticed that they had people like driving them, you know, making their coffees supporting them but it was excessive but I thought oh well you know they proclaim also to be tohungas that's maybe that's what the people do for them um, but towards the end towards commitment they said well this is your time we've given to you so you need to give back to the community you have a choice and but there was a lot of talk about you know up north is where the real work is and it was pretty much they were convincing us you know, it's like feeding people if you really want to help your people, if you really want to learn. And we were vulnerable people looking for help. This is where you need to be. And a lot of people prior um, moved up there. And I come from Kaitaia. They live in Hirakino. They had a base in Taipa, different groups. So I chose to go up there, but I stayed with my parents and I would go out to the classes that they held out at Hirakino um, and Ahipara because I wasn't 100% sure. And the driver to the guy that was the social worker that I went under his team because they had different teams, he, he said to me, oh, no, you know, we're all about the children. It's all about the children, family, community. It's a really good atmosphere. Well, when I moved up there, he left two weeks later. He forgot to tell me about that part. So I went up there and we did classes and I noticed that they did a lot of farm work. Um, but I was at my parents and then me and my dad had an argument. And without my knowledge, they moved my stuff out to the head of Keno Farm. And when I had the argument with my dad, which was not an um, you know, usual occurrence, it just happened, and it wasn't a big issue, next minute a trailer came up and my stuff was on it. And I, I was like, what did you do? And my mum said they came into the house and they said you wanted to move out. And they took your stuff. And you know, I apologised to my mother because they said that wasn't the case. But I thought, oh, well, you know, I'm here now, so I may as well stay here. So I started staying out at the farm, and I actually became the social worker's driver because they used to travel down to Auckland on a Wednesday, from Wednesday to Friday. So you attended class, you worked on the farm, you cleaned their house, you did motor mechanics, um, and basically worked for them. Yeah, he, he was a social worker. They were all social workers, but they were tohangas. The tutor that I was under, because these people I found out were distantly related to me, so I, that made me feel safer with them. Um, I was referred by my cousin, and the person, when he walked into the class, he was actually the man that my cousin, another cousin took me to see, 
um, because he knew him because of another event with another tohanga that was on similar basis. Um, and he also, the other tohanga I met at Manurewa Probation, and I was supporting someone, and I met him, and he focused on me because he said this person wasn't really interested in helping himself. And he said, oh, would you, you know, like to take this further? And it got to the point with him that he was asking me to lay with him. So, and I asked why he wanted me to go behind his house in this batch and lay with him. And he said, to help you get closer to your tūpuna. And, you know, I didn't like the idea of that, but it got to the point that he ended up in Kaitai, and I was up there at the time. This is the tohunga from probation, and he was running a program there as well. And he took me to a house, and he said, there was three other males there, and he said, I would like you to sleep between two males. I only knew one of the other males and him. And I said to him, no, I don't want to do that. And the only thing that made me realize, because I suffered disassociation and that event made me fearful, that it was not good because the house he took me to was my late father's who died when I was three, his brother's house. And we used to go there a lot and it actually made my brain register danger. Otherwise, the disassociation would have kicked in and I probably would have done it. This association is a big vulnerability. But because of whose the house was, it registered it in my brain. And anyone that suffers disassociation would understand that. The guy that I eventually came under the social worker to work in his team up in Hirakino on his farm, and they used to travel to Auckland, that he was the guy that my cousin took me to. And he walked into the class um, at the social services at Taonga Waka Marae, And I was like, well, that's that guy that my cousin took me to, you know. And he said that guy, that tohunga, was a con. And I was, so, you know, he invented an environment that I felt safe in. He was my relation. I'd met him before. He was a social worker. You know, they had a social services at a marae. The marae contracted them. So why would I feel unsafe? Basically, we were their helpers more on their farm and what they wanted us to do. We did different things at marais, funerals, whatever they wanted, we did. And within their classes, they started teaching us, like, if you disobeyed them, it went from our tūpuna to them, because they explained themselves as you, if you want more knowledge, um, you know, with even abilities, you know, like people in there, they had visions, they felt different things. It became very spiritual, you know. They said if you want more ability with that and ha physical help, the more you did for them, the more help you would get. And their teachings became that if you left, their farm or their social services that you would be punished or your family, um, your children, they counseled you and they used, they found out your weaknesses and for most people it's your family, it's your children, your grandchildren and that, were my, that was my, my children and my grandchildren. And they would say, you would be hurt if you defied us. That's what they slowly brought in. And, you know, people were like, okay, this is just not on. But I have sat down and I thought, how did they get so much control over us? Because we did what they asked because of the fear they have implanted in our heads and because of the continuous threats towards our family our children um, and ourselves. You know, anything that went wrong, like a boy fell off his bike, he was like 12, and the kids were running around going, oh, and even his parents, his mother, I was there, said to him, you know why that happened? It's because you defied the tūpuna. 
that, that's what the children were walking around saying. And it was wrong. But we were so captured, and it comes from their personal development course. And our minds to believe their beliefs, even though inside you knew it was wrong, but with myself, because of the sexual abuse in my history and the disassociation and the tiredness from working, you, you basically work seven days a week, would start at 10 o'clock, we would go all night sometimes, and that was seven days a week, so you get physically exhausted. Um, and then I would travel with him, I became his driver, travel with him Wednesday down to Auckland. We would go to the Te Angawaka Marae Social Services, work there in probation, because as part of commitment, I chose to do probation support, and I did that for three years. Um, we also did counselling. I taught a class, but I didn't teach it the way they taught it. I taught it positively and with a bit of difference. They always said they were about helping people, and that's who I am. I've done that from the age of 15. My home was always welcoming. I've helped people with mental health issues. I've got people out of jail. You know, I've supported them in court. I'm about helping people, our people. Um, so they were like candy to me and the spiritual factor, I didn't mind it, you know, um, our family believe in that and I didn't have enough knowledge of how it was taught. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I became his driver, we went to the social services, I did probation support, um, also, in their teachings, they said that if you left, you were in Makatu or Tanifa. And if you were in Tanifa, it can get to the point, this is their description, that you could pick your nose in front of someone and you wouldn't even know. You would do strange things and it's because you're in Tanifa. And that is because you went against them and your ancestors did it to you, all these it was just exhausting, you know? It made you even more vulnerable, and that applied to all of us. But they had specific, specific people that drove for them, and we were taught that not everyone could drive for them. Why? They explained that not everyone has the money to do that. But that, to me, that was part of their grooming. And the number one rule in the social services, you were not to have any sexual contact with clients. So that made me feel even safer. So this social worker and three of his siblings that were class themselves as tohungas as well, um, he gained my trust. Um, but even the children, you know, in classes, our classes would go till three in the morning. The kids had school the next day. And the parents would say, you know, our kids have got school, our partners have got work. And if you wanted to leave, you would feel it. You, everyone would turn against you, you know, or he would get sick. And everyone would say, well, you know, the people that defied him made him sick. And then his sister would come over and say, oh, you know, he's sick because he's doing all the work. It was, they played on your guilt. They played on your vulnerabilities. Um, but it was the fear they installed in you and you just don't even realise it's happening. You know, I watched the court case with David Reedy on it. It was, I'm sure it was David Reedy. And his lawyer said to him, but you had a choice. In that situation, you don't have a choice because they have your mind so turned into their ways. They have control over you. And unless you've been through it, you know, people have made jokes and they've basically, you know, said to me, oh, you were in a cult. But yes, it had cult structure. It was. After I got out, I looked it up and it was a cult structure. But because of the way they taught you, you didn't think of it like that. You knew inside it was wrong. But because they used your weaknesses or sexual abuse, 
trauma in different ways with other people, your weaknesses, your vulnerabilities, you and all the work, you just, I don't know, lost control of yourself, went deeper in yourself. And then he showed up on my doorstep. Um, I was actually living across the road, which was still part of the farm. And he said to me, oh, you know, that energy feeling, do you want to act on it? And I could see by the look in his eyes that he was going to do something that he shouldn't. And he walked towards me and he kissed me. I didn't respond because, of course, I just associated. You know, he had waited that long, gained my trust and just the shock. So basically, that night, he crossed the line of their number one rule of no sexual contact with clients. I was his client. Even though I was on that farm, it was still part of their program. And I could see, because I just associated what he was doing, I could hear, but I couldn't feel it. And after he finished, he left. And, you know, I just was devastated. It was another person that had broken my trust. And the police have told me he groomed you. That's what he did. And even that, I was like, he groomed me? You know, so it was the police that said this. And then he would show up at different times. And, you know, after that one event, I, I was just so lost. I was physically exhausted. The teachings were embedded in my head. And he created great fear crossing that line, even though there was fear there already through the teachings. So basically, I became that child that was abused in my head. I started saying no. I said to him, I don't want to be your driver. And that was the only connection I had from being fully isolated from my children, my family. And I was scared of that because I dreaded what would happen if I was just left to work out on the farm. And they did that to everyone. You know, isolated them from their families. We were good parents. Um, we had no hidden agendas. We wanted to make a better life for our children, for ourselves, for our community. Every single person that was in my class was like that. They were for their people, wanted to better themselves and their family. He would say to me, oh, well, don't drive for me then. Then he wouldn't talk to me. Um, the environment would change when we got back up to Kaitaia, and of course everyone went with him. They didn't know what you did. And he would say to me, um, just remember your children and your grandchildren. And I continuously said no, but he wouldn't find another driver. And everyone was like, I have to drive for him. I actually asked one of the other guys, I said to him, you know, can you drive for him? And he actually said to me, are you all right? And I just didn't say anything. You know, all I had in my head was, I have to protect my children. They will be hurt. That's what they had us believing. But inside I knew I had to fight to get out of there. I, I didn't like what he was doing to me. He had a partner. I would never sleep with a man with a partner. Then it got to the stage he was forcing healings onto me that I didn't want. And it had to do with sex. And he said I needed it because I'd been sexually abused. He said, but it's your choice. But he said, remember that grandson of yours. I have a, my grandson is the first grandchild of mine. And he knows how much I love him. My friend that I, we were staying at her house, she wrote in her police statement, Brenda changed, Brenda went quiet, she used to be happy, she was like part of our family, we were friends for a long time, and she would just do everything for this man, anything he said, right down to putting his socks on. You know? Um, and she wrote that... I started not eating with them. 
I would sit away from them. And she knew something was wrong. And she even asked me, you know, during the trips down there. And I just said to her, nothing. But she knew. The sexual abuse continued. Me saying no continued. The threats continued against my children, my family, myself. He even, even in class, he made an example of a woman that left. And he said, if you leave, she left us. And her daughter got raped because she left. And I was like, you know, these people are just psychologically sick. And we all knew that. And I just couldn't believe he would say that. You know? And that is just an example how in depth they mentally abused us. From John Key to Jacinda Arden, the last 10 years, 2013 I left. I've had comments like a person said to me, I thought that's what they do, you know, take people's money and pretty much what you're saying. And I was shocked. And if this is how they're teaching people and treating people, obviously it's wrong and I don't understand why no one's pulled them up. And even during the time that I have fought to stop this, I got them closed down, um, third degree covered the story, you know, I have been through the Ministry of Social Development that admitted that there was some truth to what I was saying, but they said they couldn't get contact with me, I've had the same email and phone number for the last 10 years, I went to Calvin Davis, um, he said to me, I'm taking this to Parliament. He never did. Um, you know, and in the end, continuous contact with him, he basically said in a, no, in a nice way, look, Brenda, you know, no one's going to listen. I went to Honey Harawira, and he, his receptionist said, oh, Honey said, let us know what the police are going to do. You know what they say, and he, she said, Honey said, he doesn't do other people's work. Honey presents himself as he is for our people. In Kai Tai, he is strong about he is for our Māori people. You know, and I thought he would be the one person that would really stand for this. I've been to the Hirakino Marae, I've written them official letters. They said, Oh, yes, we are there for you. But at the end of the day, no one did anything. Peter Sharples, Winston, Winston Peters, he wrote a letter to me and said, yes, this has to be dealt with. He sent me a copy of a letter he sent to Peter Sharples. Um, but nothing came of it. You know, the government, Te Puna Kōkere and the Lottery Board funded these people. They were connected to the Catholic Church. I wrote to them. Because apparently I heard the marae, I said to the marae, you know, um, I want you to support this. I went to Te Angawaka marae and they closed them down. And, but the Catholic Church didn't want them closed down. So I went to the David Thompson of the Catholic Church and I informed them of my complaint. And he said, well, maybe we should let them go. And they got closed down. And I said to the marae, I want you to help me expose this properly. By the end of it, I had meetings with them. Um, they were like, what do you want us to do? <laughs> and I said to them, I want you to help me expose this. I want justice. You know, coming back into society was hard. I started having major panic attacks. I was standing in the warehouse down at Auckland and I thought I was having a heart attack. I just didn't know society anymore. I had lived the regime for so long. You know, when we came to Auckland, we weren't allowed to do what we wanted to do, only if he said so. Even seeing my children, I had to fit into what his needs were first. So it was hard, you know, um, and even having males near me, once I was out, I would just panic. I just couldn't do it. 
I had an incident and part of my healing that I wanted to beat all this and I had my mum wait for me and I said to her, I'm going to walk past the police station from the bottom of town and it was only like 10 minutes from her house. I said, I just want to see if I can do it to try beat the anxiety. And um, this guy walked up behind me and I, I rang her and I said, Mum, come and get me. I was crying because there was a male standing behind me because of the abuse. I saw an officer, a community officer, and he said to me, you know, you have a right to press charges. I will support you through it. But he left not long after. And I did report it. Um, and then I came down to Auckland and I actually reported it to the police in Manukau. And they made like 40 mistakes in this statement. It was referred to a detective and he didn't interview anyone else. I gave him names, and he said, sorry, I don't believe you were under duress, so we're not going to take it any further. And I persisted, and they said, he said, oh, but I'm going to send it up to Kaitaia. And um, I have a letter where the police up there said, you know, you made your decision, and we think you're just doing this because I read this in the file not long after, because she writes complaints to the government departments. Like, I was had done something wrong trying to get justice, and the letter said, but we will comply, and I will do a video interview with her. And even that, I said to them, to the detective, you're... Cops made 40 mistakes in this statement, and I don't blame them because they've read it by hand. You didn't interview anyone else, and you close it down. And he said, well, I'm really sorry. That is my decision. That was basically the system's excuse that you're one person, but I wasn't one person. Um, an ex-partner of him has wrote that she was a client of his and that... After their first meeting, he turned up on her doorstep. She had just come out of a very abusive relationship over 20 years when she went to their social services. So, yeah, I have continued fighting since 2013 um, with the effects of healing, and it wasn't easy. It re-traumatised me immensely. But I knew I had to do it. One of my last memories when I knew I was going to leave and he had turned a situation around on me because he knew, so it looked like he made me leave, but I knew the truth and so did a few others. And um, he was sitting in front of these, we were out on the farm and he was sitting in front of these children and I was watching him and I was like, he's going to do to them what he did to all of us. And it was the look in their eyes. And there is only one way you get that contact. You know, I looked at one of the teenage girls. I know because I've been through that sort of abuse. But I couldn't do anything. Mentally, I just wasn't in the state too, and I was so full of fear. And in my head, I promised them I'll be back. And that's given me the drive to do this because of the children that I leave behind. How many people need to stand for this? It is wrong, culturally it's wrong. And they need to expose this properly because obviously throughout fighting this, they are not the only tohangas that are doing this. We shouldn't have to continue to fight. And I have been through health and disability. I rang to Punakokiri and they said, are you an organisation? I said, no, and they hung up on my ear. Nani Mahuta, I, she knew who I was. And I rang her and she was like, oh, Brenda, and she hung up on my ear. So I didn't take it any further. Tariana Tudia, she referred it to the Ministry of Social Development. And she said to me, you know, 
you were a very courageous person doing this. It was her and Winston Peters that probably made some sort of stand. And at the end of the day, it's not their fault their departments didn't do it properly. You know? But they are the government. They need to oversee what their departments are doing. But basically, no one wants to know. And quite I have been to you. I even went to the mayor. I went to the marae. I eventually contacted Pete, Pete Smith when I saw his video of how he talked about his sexual abuse. And I contacted him. He took it to a health meeting up there, a comatoa, got up and walked out. He said, why are you bringing that rubbish here? But the sad thing is, I found out later on, the community actually knew what was happening up there. It's continuing to this day, and I know it is. I told the police their plan was to get quali everyone qualified, come into Kaiaraia, which they have done, and get to the social welfare kids. I remember the social worker I worked under and his team on the farm, he made a statement and he said to one of the clients that were there on his farm, staying on his farm, oh, well, you'll be qualified soon and you'll be able to take in social welfare kids. I was like, there is no way I'm going to let that happen. You know, and I rang Oranga Tamariki in Kaita and they went out there and apparently they went out there and I rang them back and I said, well, I told them the situation. And they were like, no, they're fine. You know, but in Kaitai, everyone up there is more who you are, who your family is. And I know for a fact that he had family in Oranga Tamariki. A health and disability, they said, is not their problem. I went to Waitomo and said, you've employed someone and I'm giving you a reason why you should not have him working there. There is vulnerable people. They said, we've done a place check. But by the Social Workers Act, if you have doubts about someone, basically they shouldn't be in your organisation. But I feel with Kai Taya that they would rather protect the people that hurt people than the actual victims. So I have done my best, and the people that have come forward, um, I am the only woman, but in these statements... I am the only woman willing to talk about what happened and I can understand why they don't want to because they're so scared. And one of the other clients have written that in her police statement. I don't understand why he wasn't charged, if we're talking about just sexual charges. But like I said to the police, it's not just sexual charges. There's a lot more charges that could be involved. I even researched charges and they ignored them that I thought applied to this case. The Catholic Church, I mean, we used to go to lunch at their big church in Auckland. They actually bought Tere Angawaka Marae, best to my knowledge, and the social services had a lot of contact with them, obviously, because we used to go there every week, every year and get photos with them, um, these social workers at their church in town, you know, the big, I don't know, it must be their main temple in town, every year. So their connection is one, they were connected work-wise and they own Te Angawaka Marae and Te Angawaka Marae contracted these social services, you know. And at the end of the day, the marae has a big responsibility in this. And I wasn't the first person that went to them and said, hey, people in prior classes of this personal development program had gone to the marae, a group of them, and said they are abusing people. And that was ignored by the marae. One of the clients went to Kaitaia Police before I even started at the social services and said, they're grooming women for sex are out there. Kaitaia Police did nothing. So it's just been one, a big system letdown. It's been a big, for me, my hometown has let me down. They have let down children that have gone through your social services. 
And they can't say I haven't told them. I've told them officially. Officially, this is going on. I've done the right thing, written letters, gone to Calvin Davis, gone to Honey. I've basically gone to everyone. And I will still keep fighting. You know, that memory of those kids, I promised them I would come back for them. And I won't stop until they are stopped.